Hi, everybody. I can see there's a few people already attending. I'll just give it a couple of minutes to let people join, and then we'll get going. I'm conscious of time. We are recording the meeting for people to fo follow up and catch up on at a later date if they're unable to actually make the meeting itself. So I wonder if it might just be worth starting as you know, people are continuing to arrive. I realise that um, it's probably busy time in primary care, wherever you're working at the moment, and it's a hot day and, and probably grabbing your lunch and stuff, but it's probably worth making a start because I know. We've got two speakers ready to go who've got a very um, informative um, presentation for us all. So um, just a couple of introductory slides from me and then I'll pass the microphone to, to Joe's that we've got in waiting. So thank you for those who are attending live and those who are going to catch up later online. Um, this is a second set of series um, of webinars we've run since COVID hit really and we could do less in a face-to-face -face format. Um, they are funded this time completely by Macmillan, so free to attend for all attendees, and we're very grateful for Macmillan Cancer support for that. Um, the organisation has been done by Cardiff University. Um, Charlotte Stevenson will have sent you out the invites, and, and I'm really grateful for Cardiff Uni's support for that. And then the support from Mick Button and colleagues at Valindra, where I work as a GP lead, um, is also hugely received as well. So today's session is on managing and diagnosing breast cancers, and we've got two um, colleagues from Belindra speaking today. So we've got one of the consultants, Jo um, Ocean, Ocean, sorry, who is um, yeah. what, one of the um, oncologists at Belindra and her CNS colleague, Joanne Wiltshire, um, and they're gonna do an update on breast cancer and the management of it. A couple of ha housekeeping things from myself. Um, we are recording it. Um, we're not gonna do live Q and A, but you can write the Q and A and any questions you have in the in the Q and A panel or the chat bar, and we'll be keeping an eye on that. If there's anything that really isn't understood that um, either the Joes are presenting, then we can interrupt and ask the questions. Um, there is an evaluation survey at the very end of the series of slides, um, and if you can complete that, if you want the certificate of attendance for CPD credit and whatever else, then um, once completed, you can get that. And we're just really grateful for any feedback just to help shape the next set of sessions. If you're finding them useful, so that'd be really helpful. Um, if you can just move the slide on and then Charlotte, if you could just share the um, polls, we've just got a couple of quick queries um, about where, if you're able to just fill us in, if you're attending today um, live, where do you currently work, where do you consider your first place of work to be, mainly in the community, mainly in a nursing home, mainly secondary care, mainly in palliative care or a mixture? I'm really sorry, I'm not able to move the slide, I don't know if Charlotte has to make me a host again. Ah, uh, okay, no worries. Charlotte's managing to share the poll, so we'll do that first of all, and then we'll move on. That's great. You should be able to move the slide along, even though I'm sharing the, the poll. No, I can't do anything. Oh, because it's picking up your screen. Hang on. Unless I stop sharing. Yeah, do you want to start and stop it and start it again and see if that works? And the second um, slide in the poll there, Charlotte, if you have had the feedback on the first one, is just about um, where you are in the world. So that showed that mainly community and some palliative care colleagues on the call. So that's great to know. Thank you. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Charlotte, you able to share the one about, about location? Oh, sorry, it's that 
that's the second one, is it? So my apologies. Um, so yeah, what's the main role um, that you do if you could complete that? And then is there a final slide about where you are in the world, Charlotte? Have you not got that one today? We haven't got that one today. That's fine. No worries, that's great. Sorry, should I start? No, I think we just need the poll to come down. There we go. So um, most people, again, as it said, really GPs or GPs trainees, um, another GP in training and some palliative care colleagues. Great, thank you. Um, on that introductory slide as well, we had mentioned of Fiona, Dr. Fiona Rawlinson, who's also been hugely influential in helping us and is um, you know, one of the um, programme directors within uh, Cardiff Uni postgrad and uh, is so good at teaching that she's meant to be teaching in two places today and is actually in a face to face meeting in Leeds. So she can't be with us, but is definitely with us in spirit. And we're really grateful for her support. So now, Joe, is the time I shall ask you to take over and I'll put myself and um, my, on mute and turn the cameras off. So it's all about you. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. Um, so thank you once again for inviting us um, to speak and um, to talk about um, breast cancer management. Um, I hope that we do hope that you find it um, informative and feel free to ask us questions um, during and of course after the talk. So we work in um, Princess of Wales Hospital in Bridgend, so that's our patch of patients, and we do a um, clinic up there, see new patients, and also um, do a chemotherapy, systemic and cancer treatment um, clinic up there as well once a week. So um, today we're, we're going to talk about um, a range of things, so I, I try to um, be um, as comprehensive as possible. Um, so it will just be a general overview of the pathway of how we manage patients with early breast cancer. We'll briefly talk about the different types of breast cancer and how we manage them. We'll also talk about any recent clinic, clinical updates of, um, in managing these patients. And also we'll talk about the holistic um, aspect. Um, and this is where Jo steps in with her expertise. Of, of how best we support our patients during their journey of treatment with us. Um, so as we know, breast cancer is the most common cancer in the UK. Um, it accounts for about 15% um, of uh, all, new, all new cancer and diagnoses um, as of the data in 2018. Uh, we have about, uh, so back in 2018, there was a new, um, sorry, 56,000 new cancer diagnoses. About 70% of patients um, do actually end up surviving their cancer for 10 years or more. So um, we are seeing this picture more and more. So more and more patients are being cured and we are developing more and more treatments um, to keep it that way. So um, adjuvant treatments and um, better yeah, techniques of managing these patients. So we are seeing some good results um, as our um, clinical practice grows. So the main types of invasive breast cancer we see are the ductal carcinoma, um, which originate from the milk ducts, and the lobular carcinomas, which are the lobules um, um, just behind the, um, areo the yeah, areola and the nipple. And so, with the invasive ductal, that's I'll probably say that's more common, isn't it, that we see. Um, the lobular cancers um, can be quite unusual in how they present, and they're not actually as sensitive to chemotherapy. So with we would manage them both the same in the early breast cancer setting, but sometimes we get unusual um, presentations of lobular cancers. So some patients can present in a really unusual way um, when having recurrent disease. So for example, I've seen um, patients presenting with um, malignant um, disease in the esophagus, for example, um, cutaneous disease, just very, very unusual compared to our ductal carcinomas. Um, we divide breast cancer largely in these subtypes. So you're all familiar with these, um, I'm sure. So the vast majority 
of cases are the um, hormone receptor positive HER2 negative. So that counts for about 65 to 70% of patients. For HER2 um, receptor positive, that's about 15%. The triple negatives are the ones that are the less common. Um, and with these cancers, unfortunately, because they don't exhibit any of the receptors, there's no targeted treatments that we can give in addition to chemotherapy that will be effective. So chemotherapy in the um, early breast cancer setting and the metastatic breast cancer setting are the mainstay of treatment. In a metastatic setting, we're starting to use immunotherapy. Um, for certain groups of patients. And, um, and I'll talk about more about the horizon of what's coming in the future. And I'm sure that immunotherapy are going, is going to be um, approved soon for use in early breast cancer, but we can talk about that closer to the time. But as things stand, um, it's the triple negative breast cancers, unfortunately have the poorest prognosis, most likely to occur. Um, so, of the young people. Yeah. Yes, yeah, we do unfortunately see that, that our younger patients tend to have the more aggressive forms of cancer, presenting usually with triple negative breast cancer. So, yeah. So this really is just a schema um, of just how, just a general way of how we manage our patients. So, of course, a patient will present to you in the community, to the GP, with symptomatic breast cancer, we also have, um, of course, the breast test whales, of course, picking up um, abnormal mammograms as well. So it's either screen detected or symptomatic where they present to their um, GP or local physician. They're then referred to the breast cancer team where the patient undergoes a triple assessment, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, which um, consists of a clinical examination Imaging, which is usually a mammogram and ultrasound imaging of the breast and the axilla, the corresponding axilla. And um, of course, with the ultrasound scan, we do a biopsy as well. And this, all of these results are then discussed in the breast cancer MBT meeting. And depending on the type of breast cancer, um, as all MDT meetings, we do um, formulate a plan according to the histopathology results and the radiological results. And yeah, so certain groups of patients now, so this is quite relative, I guess this is quite relatively new. So the triple negative breast cancer group that I mentioned before, and the group that um, exhibit the HER2 receptor positive, they are offered neoadjuvant treatment. So that is treatment given with a view to shrink down the cancer or induce what we say a complete pathological response before they go on to have their um, surgery, essentially. So that would either be, a, depending on of the um, histopathology um, and the extent of the cancer, it could either be a mastectomy or a wide local excision. So by offering them neoadjuvant treatment, we actually give them um, more options from the surgical site. Yeah. Um, and also, it also gives them more treatment options as well going forward for yeah. surgery. So with the triple negative breast cancer, we would um, give usually about four to five months of chemotherapy. And part and part way through, they would have an ultrasound imaging usually or MRI imaging um, organised by the breast cancer team to assess response they complete their treatment and go on to have surgery. With the HER2 positive cancers, we have chemotherapy with a HER2 targeted drug called Fesgo, which is relatively new. And this is a combination of Herceptin with Pertuzumab. And um, so this is a triplet of, of treatment that we give to this group of patients. Um, the ER positive patients, um, they, so the, each, the hormone receptor positive patients tend to go for surgery first off um, as chemotherapy, um, we don't see as good results with chemotherapy. So they would go on to have their, um, so on this part, um, the hormone receptor positive patients were going to have um, the breast surgery. They would have a sentinel lymph node biopsy up front. If that 
does the central lymph node biopsy is positive, they'll then go on to have an um, auxiliary node clearance. And um, then they would go on to have adjuvant treatment. So sticking with this line here, so with the breast surgery, they're going to have, depending on the type of cancer, it'll be adjuvant radiotherapy, um, which would be given with a view to reduce it in local recurrence. If there has been a lot of lymph node involvement um, that we can see in the histopathology analysis of the um, auxiliary node clearance, then we would think about adjuvant radiotherapy um, to the supracubicular fossa. Um, we would also, for those that are hormone receptor positive, they would go on to have um, five to 10 years of, um, of hormone therapy. I'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, for high risk patients, they would um, go on to have chemotherapy, um, followed by radiotherapy and hormone therapy. And for our postmenopausal patients, which is a new, a relatively new treatment that we've been using in recent years, um, this is, um, we get, we offer to our post, so patients of all types of cancers that are postmenopausal, we give zoledronic acid um, to reduce the risk of bony recurrence. Okay, so it's quite a lot of <laughs> treatment. And you can imagine when patients come to our clinic um, to talk about systemic therapy, um, they are obviously very overwhelmed with the amount of information. So it's, we try and give it in a bite-sized way, general overview, and then we just focus on each step as they go forward. Um, so going back onto the new adjuvant parts, um, so once they've had hopefully a complete pathological, sorry, a complete response on the ultrasound scan, they have breast surgery, and there's a complete pathological response on the histopathology analysis, and um, patients will then go on. So if it's HER2 positive patient, they'll go on to complete their anti-HER2 treatment for a year and they would go on to do their zoledronic um, acid um, for the postmenopausal patient. Incomplete pathological response. Unfortunately, there are a few patients that um, still have residual disease and they have, we haven't achieved a complete pathological response. They go on to have um, additional adjuvant systemic therapy, whether it's chemotherapy for triple negative or an, another anti-HER2 drug called um, CADSILA, okay? Feel free to ask me questions at this point. Okay, so I thought I'd start by talking about um, a couple of in a couple of cases. So two of them are quite typical, I would say, and one is quite an interesting case. Then I'll talk about the clinical updates um, and then various parts of the treatment journey and how we manage side effects, etc., and support our patients through. Um, so the, this is the first case. So it's a 40 year old um, lady, um, previously very fit and well, had a symptomatic right lump um, presented um, to her um, GP, went to the breast team, underwent triple um, assessment. Um, unfortunately on the ultrasound here that you can see here um, and the uh, mammogram, um, you can see like a three centimeter uh, lesion. I'm no radiologist, but even I can see that. Um, and then they went on to have an MRI to help plan the surgery, what type of surgery um, she could have. Unfortunately, it confirmed that it was a triple negative breast cancer. She had the clip inserted because Hopefully we achieve a complete response. Um, so if, if a patient was to go and have some um, radiotherapy and surgery, um, we need that clip there to show where the tumor bed was. Um, the patient at that point came to me to talk about neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And we also talk about, for all our triple negatives, we talk about um, cancer genetics testing, so counseling. So we give them information on the counseling. Um, we don't do it right away. We give them some time to think about it. Um, and then thankfully um, here in Valinja, we do actually have an oncology pathway for all our triple, ne triple negative breast cancer patients under the age of 60. But otherwise, um, for patients that fall outside of that criteria, we refer um, to the um, cancer genetics department. It can take a long time. Yeah. yeah. Um, this, this, this test, waiting for this test can be quite traumatic for our patients we find um there's a lot of and, and even making the decision to have it done so obviously we give 
a lot of support and guards information for, for having the test. Um, and obviously, if they want to discuss it further, we can get the genetics team involved. Yeah. Um, but particularly for these patients, obviously, because it has such an impact on the type of surgery, whether they go for bilateral mastectomies, um, also the um, increased risk of having ovarian cancer later in life, mm -hmm. you know, that, and also when, particularly if they've got families with um, daughters. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, an added worry when they're trying to cope with their own diagnosis as well. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's a lot to think mm -hmm. about, isn't it? Um, so I'll talk a bit more about the cancer genetics um, process in a bit. But this lady um, did have the PALP2 um, uh, onco gene. And so she was actually, so NICE has approved risk-reducing mastectomy on the contralateral side. So she went on to have a bilateral mastectomy on the contralateral side to reduce the risk of recurrence, because unfortunately she has a PALP2 gene, um, which I think increased the risk um, of recurrence by about almost, I think about 40%, I think. So quite a significant risk. Um, yeah, so she went on to have, um, I think immediate reconstruction as well. Um, so the chemotherapy we, tend, we offer our patients is depending on how fit the patient is, et cetera. Um, it tends to range between four and five months, and we assess the response, usually on ultrasound scan, sometimes MRI, um, halfway through um, by the breast team. And depending on the response, normally the chemotherapy is a combination anyway, so they have one phase of treatment, and then they go on to have another phase anyway. So we would switch the treatment anyway. Um, and if we sometimes, occasionally, unfortunately, we see that they don't have the best response on the first phase, and then we see a better response on the second phase. So she actually, um, yeah, so she had a complete um, pathological response um, on, after her surgery and follow up now is an annual mammogram for five years, okay, um, under the surgeons usually and clinical review. Um, I was going to say one thing I might add with with the type of patients that Joe's just discussed is obviously the anxiety that is associated with moving forward and knowing mm. that they've got a triple negative breast cancer. Yes. And the request for CT scans, which isn't um, our standard. Um, yeah. And and managing that and moving those patients forward is 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 can be very difficult for them um, we have moving forward courses available um, they were online and you can still register online with breast cancer now or um, we're starting to have sessions now face to face opening up in the different areas um, so that's that's very helpful for patients going forward yeah that's a really that's a really good point mm. isn't it there is no evidence to show that ct follow-up um, changes the overall survival outcome and there's no evidence there. So um, some of us do, and myself too, so the high-risk patients, um, I, I do offer a, a sick monthly CT scan. Um, and for, for a couple of years, probably two to three years, but it, as Joe says, it's, it's very difficult for them to live with that uncertainty of the cancer um, coming back. So yeah, that's a difficult process really. So the next case is a 65-year-old uh, um, patient, fit and well teacher, who was actually had a screen-detected breast cancer. Triple assessment showed that it was a HER2 um, negative, ER positive cancer. She went on to have um, up, upfront set of lymph node biopsy, which was negative, followed by um, a wide local excision. This histology showed that it was, although it was quite small, 20 millimetres, it was a high grade. So with the grade is from one to three. So three obviously being the more poorly dif differentiated, more aggressive type, and it was a ductal carcinoma. So what I didn't mention in our little pathway is that um, we, are, we have got some um, genetic assays um, that can help guide us in 
assessing whether a patient would get any benefit from chemotherapy. So obviously you have your two groups, the really low risk group, the small node negative cancers, ER positive, HER2 negative, um, they go on to have you know, their surgery, radiotherapy, hormones, good. Hormones for five years and that's that. So they don't need any chemotherapy and there would be no benefit of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy benefit would probably be like less than 1% um, uh, benefit, survival benefit. You obviously have your high risk patients um, with um, a high number of lymph nodes involved. So I would say three, three or more lymph nodes involved. The large breast cancers, the, um, then we would think about um, offering them chemotherapy up front. So there's the, the middling group where some that we need to tease really whether they would get some benefit or not. So it would be what what it has been good is um, it's been good for identifying patients that um, would not have any um, benefit from chemotherapy and we can spare them from those side effects. And sometimes those side effects can be life threatening, that life, you know, um, life threatening neutropenic sepsis. So if we can avoid that, pick up those patients that we know don't have, um, that wouldn't have any benefit from chemo and spare them those side effects, and that's great. And there's been, we've been able to use this assay for these type of patients. And it basically is called a non cotype DX. I'll talk about it in the next slide, I think. Um, and basically it's a genetic assay. I think it's 21 gene assay um, sent over to San Francisco in America. They come up with a score. The higher the score, the more likely it is that um, they have, will have risk of recurrence. And they also assess the benefit from chemo as well. And so with this patient, the score was low, so she didn't have to have chemo. Well, we, we didn't recommend it and she was delighted. And um, she is on five years of hormone treatment. And um, we've referred her also to start the um, isolodronic acid. This is an interesting case. It's not typical at all, but it was, it was quite interesting. Um, so it was a, a lovely lady um, who actually, she um, presented with an auxiliary mass after a few days after her COVID jab. Um, and um, she, I think she presented initially privately. Um, she went on to have a PET scan, which actually showed two cancers. So as you can see here, it showed a lung tumor. And it also showed um, a auxiliary tail left breast cancer and an auxiliary node involved as well. So if it wasn't for, um, I, I don't, uh, she thought, I think she was quite grateful that she had that reaction to COVID because um, it obviously brought her attention to this um, um, pathological lymph node. Obviously it's not from COVID, but she, if it wasn't for that, she wouldn't have known and then we wouldn't have picked up the lung cancer. So um, the, lung, the lung cancer um, turned out to be a primary adenocarcinoma and um, the breast cancer was an ER negative HER2 breast cancer. Um, so we decided that, I, you know, I thought it was best that she has the, um, the lung surgery um, up front and, um, and then we would go on to give her the neoadjuvant chemotherapy with the FESCO, which is a Herceptin and Pertuzumab, um, only because I, I would feel that the lung cancer would have um, a poorer prognosis um, and the breast cancer would be easier to manage. Um, so, we, so the cardiothoracic team did a great job and they did, um, they carried it carried out a left lung bats and upper lobe resection. Um, she went on to meet me, bless her, after I think only four weeks post-surgery or less than that. And we arranged for her to have nearly adjuvant chemo um, with the combination um, anti-HER2 therapy. She had an amazing response. Um, so her um, mass, her disease was impalpable, so I can palpate it on clinical examination. Um, the, the, mid the midway point ultrasound scan showed a complete response, essentially. Um, so um, she's done really well. 
and she is being worked up for a mastectomy and auxiliary node clearance and she will continue with the FESGO providing that there's no um, residual tumour um, for a year. She's post, she is premenopausal, so we wouldn't be offering her um, Zimita at that point. So this is just the, um, the clinical update, basically. So then, so just move this thing. I'll just leave it. So these are just the newer things that you may have not have heard of before. Um, so the Oncotype DX test I talked about, and it helps. Um, it's a good prognostic indicator. Um, for so it works out the risk of recurrence, and it also works out the um, and estimates the benefit of the chemotherapy and endocrine treatment. Um, the FESGO I mentioned, so we now use that for our node positive, the um, HER2 positive patients um, you, um, in a near adjuvant setting before key, before surgery, and then they complete it in the adjuvant setting um, for. Um, patients that have been node negative, um, they go on to have Herceptin. Dolodronic acid, so it is three years of bisphosphonate treatment um, every six months, and it's for postmenopausal ladies. Um, studies have shown that it can offer a two to three percent um, benefit in terms of reducing the risk of bony recurrence in particular and also has some overall survival benefits as well. Um, and so, yeah, uh, with our breast radiotherapy, also just to quickly mention that generally um, the fast forward trial um, has indicated that um, there's just as much benefit reducing local recurrence with one week of radiotherapy versus three weeks of radiotherapy. So this is a bit more on the Oncotype DX test. So it just basically, for those intermediate risk patients, it just helps us decide who would benefit from chemo or not. So the score is from zero to 100, zero to 20 being, or zero to 15 being that there'll be no benefit from chemo. Um, above 25, so 25 to set to um, 100, that would be in, indicate high risk and therefore we would offer chemotherapy. This is another, um, so this is a clinical trial. So these are for our node positive, ER positive patients, um, HER2 negative. So it's for, again, it's looking in that middle group of patients with um, that are, um, have a, a small number of nodes. Um, though actually in this trial, you can go up to nine nodes. Um, and it's basically trying to tease that, seeing whether um, the, the genetic assay, I think in Optima is, is something called prosignia, and it, um, it analyzes a higher number of um, genes. Interesting whether the prosignia test can help guide us um, with some degree of accuracy um, with treatment, whether we can. Um, avoid chemotherapy for those patients that wouldn't get any benefit. And those patients that are, we offer this child to um, have to have a, um, a fairly big tumor, so above 30 millimeters, up to positive, um, nine positive lymph nodes, um, and they have to be above 40 years old. There, has, there is data to show that our younger patients with um, node positive disease, um, do benefit from chemo, so we would still offer chemotherapy to the node positive. So this, so the data really is kind of pushing us towards using this really in, um, for patients with node positive disease um, um, to, yeah, it, that are postmenopausal. It would be safe to use this these kind of genetic assay tests to help guide us to avoid chemo. So. Um, with the endocrine therapy, so it's for, so basically it's just to clarify um, the duration and um, who we offer what and for what reason. So for lymph nodes negative disease, low risk disease, we say five years of endocrine therapy um, is sufficient. There's, um, there, 
there is there is no evidence there to suggest that any longer with this type of disease would offer more benefits. So five years is sufficient. For patients with high risk disease, so i.e. Um, heavy lymph node positive or yeah, lymph node positive disease, we would say 10 years basically of endocrine therapy. Um, we offer, in terms of our postmenopausal ladies, um, we do um, offer aromatase inhibitors um, such as letrozole. And there is strong data um, to show that um, that does provide a survival benefit. And we can use tamoxifen, but our first choice would be the electrozoles, the XMS stains, the aromatase inhibitors. And they basically um, work in our peripheral body tissues, um, adipose tissues, and in, in preventing the, um, so they basically inhibit the aromatase enzyme to convert the androgens to estrogens in those tissues. The tamoxifen works directly on the um, estrogen synthesis in the ovaries. So we're able to use that for our ladies in pre, that are premenopausal. For our high risk patients and young patients, we would also um, block off the, um, the ovaries by using glycerolin as well as um, either an AI or, or tamoxifen. So these patients have to have uh, monthly Zolodex injections or 12 weekly post-op injections of, um, in addition to the tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitor. I think probably at this point to say that this aspect of um, patient treatment can cause the most problems mm -hmm. um, for patients moving forward. Um, I think they often feel, you know, they finish the chemotherapy and then this that taking a tablet every day is going to be much more straightforward. But unfortunately for a lot of women, they get a lot of debilitating side effects, yeah. um, ranging from muscle, joint aches and pains, um, memory problems, um, vagina dryness, um, and it impacts on every aspect of their life, it really both does. at home and work. And this is a big area which um, our team helped manage alongside also the breast surgical nurses um, who also advise patients on how to manage these treatments. Um, we, we have one of um, my colleagues here at Belindra um, is, is an expert really in, in managing menopausal um, side effects uh, induced by endocrine therapy. And um, she runs sessions um, every other week, um, which now are face to face in the Maggie Centre, which is something that uh, a charity which is based in our car park. And we work very closely with them um, in supporting our patients. Um, and uh, the patients really find these sessions very um, useful and beneficial. It helps them to understand why they get the symptoms and how best to recognize the symptoms and why they've got them and strategies to help um, them look after their body and mind moving forward. And I know certainly if any GPs in the area um, feel that they might benefit from, from attending this session, my colleague Gail will would be very welcome for you to attend one of her sessions if you, find, if you think that would be beneficial to your care. In, in your practices, because I know a lot of our a lot of our patients also go to you as well mm. um, to discuss management of these side effects. Thank you, Paul. Um, so just to talk about the cancer genetics referral. So the cancer genes we test for is a BRCA one and two, of course, CP53, PAL2, as I mentioned before, the P10 and STK11. These affects probably about five to ten percent of the breast and ovarian cancers. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have a pathway now, um, kind of an expedited pathway for our triple negative patients um, who are under sixty years old. Um, they say fast track, but really it's probably not two months. Mm -hmm. you know, two, yeah. yeah, probably eight to nine weeks. Um, otherwise, it can be um, three months actually. Um, as I mentioned before with our previous case, um, BRCA positive patients are often risk reducing um, bilateral um, mastectomies as well. Um, this here, I just have a 
patients. We we would obviously ourselves refer. I wouldn't expect you as the um, the primary um, care to do this, but just for your interest, um, these are the the, the referral guidelines um, for the um, cancer genetics um, service. So 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 the patients that are I guess um, hormone receptor positive, HER2 positive with um, family history of breast or ovarian, I think prostate as well, um, they can be referred to this service and they've sent a, um, usually a questionnaire um, for the, if they're eligible and then they go from there with the counselling and they go on then to do the testing. Um, so some of this has already been mentioned, but some of the things to consider, um, certain issues to consider for patients on hormone treatment. Obviously, we have to measure the vitamin D um, level. Um, most of us in this lovely country probably have got low vitamin D. And I would say that most of our patients do have low vitamin yeah. D. And it's imperative that we replace this, um, particularly those that go on to have the um, zoledronic acid um, ad adjuvantly. Um, and also, yeah, patients also go, do have reduced bone density from being postmenopausal. And also being in the realm of taste inhibitors, they have their own risk um, of um, fracture. So for patients that are, um, so in terms of DEXA scans, where you we're requesting them less and less actually since the advent of adjuvant zoledronic acid, patients obviously don't need the DEXA scan if they're receiving bisphosphonate treatment. But for those that aren't for whatever reason, um, we have to do a FRAC score, which I'll show you in a bit to calculate the risk. And then I think where we can request the DEXA scans. Um, in terms of managing side effects, um, Joe um, kindly mentioned them before. Um, we say, so usually the debilitating symptoms are the, um, the general aches and pains, the fatigue, um, tiredness, usually flushes. the hot flushes, so the menopausal like symptoms. We, we, we normally say that um, we like our patients if possible. It's easy, come, easy coming from us, but if possible to persevere for the first six to eight weeks of treatment, because generally after that, symptoms do tend to settle down. And so we um, generally catch up with our patients on hormone treatment about eight weeks after starting just to see how they're getting on. And most of them are, um, by then, are coping okay, actually. And they can come back to us if they are struggling in the future. Um, for groups of our patients who say they can't tolerate the treatment, um, what we tend to do is give them um, six weeks off it to ascertain if the problems are specifically related to the endocrine therapy, because they aren't always. Um, and then we would then arrange to ring them at, at the end of six weeks to assess how they are and then, and then take it from there, whether they would want to try it again or um, whether we need to look at changing it. Obviously, we don't want to change it unnecessarily to a different endocrine therapy, but you know, in some cases, that is, a, is the only option if we're going to maintain them taking um, yeah. the cancer therapy for the period of time we want them to. Yeah, and sometimes it's just weighing up the risks and benefits as well. Mm -hmm. So I had um, one of my patients who works as an ac acupuncturist and her, she had a very low risk cancer in her risk of, um, but, well, her benefit from the um, hormone treatment was calculated as 1%, so hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative. And so she was having debilitating symptoms, the fatigue, the achiness, it affected her sex life as well. Um, she um, suffered from vaginal atrophy and dryness. And so she decided, um, she made that decision not to, and that, that's their decision, and she was very sensible woman and it was affecting the quality of life at the end of the day. She had at least three years anyway of the endocrine treatment at that point. So um, so sometimes patients have to make, make that decision. And sometimes when we have those discussions with patients who have got so far along their endocrine therapy, we use the PREDICT tool um, yeah. to, to, to discuss with them the benefit of them continuing. Yeah, mm. so the PREDICT tool, so this is what we were using widely, mainly really before the Onca type, isn't it? So it's it's a, it's a really good tool. So it's um, 
based on a study of over 20,000 patients with early breast cancer patients, and it looked at the outcomes of these patients with particular characteristics of the early breast cancer patients. And based on that, it comes up with a very rough estimate of um, likelihood of recurrence, survival at five years, 10 years, with surgery, with endocrine therapy alone, with chemotherapy, and Zometa as well. So that is another tool that we, we can use to give us a rough guides about how um, useful the um, chemotherapy or hormone treatment is at reducing the risk of the cancer coming back. Um, other things to consider as well is um, patients with um, history of um, embolic events. Tamoxifen is well known to, um, it, it can increase the risk of um, blood clots. Um, also, it can increase too much and can increase the risk of, of um, endometrial thickening as well. So if there's any patients on tamoxifen that present with, um, with bleeding, um, that needs to be investigated. And we have picked up on that sometimes and we've had to change the hormone treatment to an aromatase inhibitor. Um, and there is some data to show that there is some risk with um, increasing the risk of ischemic heart disease as well. So that's something we need to be careful and mindful of when managing our patients on hormone treatment. And actually just another thing about um, the, the women that we give um, the ovarian suppression to using glossorelin. We've obviously recently had the introduction of three monthly ProStap. Um, yeah. So we tend to start them on the glossorelin until we know that they're, we've got a, a few months induced of menopause. induced menopause, and then we would um, swap them over to, to the ProStat 3 monthly, which for, for a lot of women is much more convenient because it's only got to be given three monthly. It's also a much pleasant, more pleasant injection to have with yeah. the glossorelin. Yeah. But having said that, we have, had a, we have had quite a few women that have changed over to ProStat that actually it doesn't suit them. And they've actually struggled more having that. So we have um, we have converted people back to yeah. glossorelin if, if they find that um, is the case. Yeah. So this is just the facts to what I'm talking about um, for um, premenopausal patients on um, glossorelin and AIs and postmenopausal patients are not on, on Zometa. Um, if they if we're worried about their um, bone density score, um, bone density risk and things like that, um, then we can go on to requested DEXA scan. Um, so this is just more a slide really about the surfaces um, that Joe has touched on already. Um, so when they come into us, we always offer a referral to the welfare right services, usually Macmillan or ten of us, um, and by those. Um, services and they can be offered things and um, benefits such as a badge, um, health related benefits um, such as attendance allowance, carers allowance, PIP, um, PIP as well and they may be entitled to grants so there's just um, certain benefits that they may be entitled to obviously because cancer is not just about the cancer itself it's the dealing with the um, psychosocial um, socioeconomic um, uh, consequences as well and we try to support them through that. I think one of the important things to say at this point and I certainly I've had some inquiries from GPs about some of our patients that perhaps decline counselling when they were going mm. through treatment and, and have come to a point quite late on that they, they actually do require that and in fact the Maggie Centre patients can refer themselves to counselling. They can also refer themselves there for um, welfare advice as well. So as well as us making referrals within the Lindra setting, uh, Maggie's offers a, a, an awful lot of very beneficial services for patients. And often we find patients often prefer perhaps to go refer themselves for counselling in Maggie's because it's, a, it's removed from the hospital setting. It's um, formal, and it's, it? Yes, it's a nice environment there. They have a drop in, you can just drop in. They run all sorts of different courses. It's definitely worth keeping up to date with, with their, because they're constantly changing their timetable. Um, they run um, exercise classes, they can do yoga. Um, they also run um, 
emotional resilience workshops for people. Um, and I know just really in the last week, they're running family, uh, a special family session. Um, they setting up groups for younger women um, and uh, also groups for secondary breast cancer. So that it's constantly changing. So it's certainly worth keeping um, up to date and looking on their website regularly to see what's on offer for people. If you do have patients coming back to you sort of later down the line, um, and they need some, some support. There's a lot available there. Yeah. There's a lot of these centres. Mm -hmm. So um, this is the, the Maddie Centre here. So it, I mean, they're going for a, a rustic yeah, kind Scandinavian. of Scandinavian vibe. Um, but it's lovely in there. Um, yes. I mean, we, we were lucky enough to use the centre ourselves during COVID when they were not having any patients in there. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we certainly found it beneficial and, and patients, certainly the feedback from them is, is that they really enjoying find it. it very good yeah. Yeah. so what's on the horizon so i think i touched on it before um and we're quaking a little bit aren't we, <laughs> we are <laughs> yeah um it's amazing obviously to have um these um new treatments that have been um, proven to be effective um but it's just, I guess it's, it's down to us really how we're going to implement it. So um, it looks like there's going to be some immunotherapy treatment that's going to be approved for triple negative breast cancer in the early um, breast cancer setting, um, which is great because um, at the moment we just have chemo really. Um, so that will be given alongside the chemotherapy. So that has been investigated and looks like it's, it's probably something that's going to be approved um, by next year. We also have um, with our hormone receptor positive patients as a targeted drug called CJK46. Um, may have heard of how pribocyclib, ribocyclib. Um, so it's a targeted drug that we give alongside the aromatase inhibitor. Um, and we use it widely in metastatic um, breast cancer and um, to really good results. We get really good durable survival responses. And um, the Monarchy trial um, has shown that there is a survival um, benefit, uh, reducing the risk of recurrence with um, this used in the adjuvant setting. So that's something um, that's only been approved on Friday. So we need to implement it um, over the summer. Um, also we can, that we are in investigating. So there's clinical trials that we have in Belinda for patients um, that ha have, haven't quite responded to the new adjuvant treatment. So we're going to be looking at um, offering a CAD silo, which is another type of anti HER2 drug um, with immunotherapy, and of, and of course the um, PARP inhibitors. Um, that's um, been investigated as well, the role in the new adjuvant setting before surgery and after surgery. So breast cancer, this is a lot of development and a lot of information, uh, both for us and for patients coming, yeah, coming it's, forward. The landscape has changed so much since um, I was a registrar back mm -hmm. in 2015. And it's amazing um, what has changed and things are const constantly changing. On a, you know, sometimes feels like a month on a yeah. basis. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot happening there, and um, we'll keep you obviously updated. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, any questions? Oh, it was brilliant. Thanks both. Um, I'm very well keeping to time as well. So, well done, both of you. Um, there haven't been any questions typed in. There's a QA panel, so people are very welcome to enter questions in there yeah. if you want to. Um, I'll keep an eye on that while I'm speaking. But I guess a couple that came up from my point of view from you know what we see in primary care. So the first one, just yeah. to in, as your slides went really, was just about that onco um type yeah. and, and the samples being sent off to the states. And um Joanne, you mentioned that there would be patient anxiety around this time. And I'm guessing people don't necessarily know what it, their plan is, do they? And that's mm. kind of apprehensive time where they're likely to come back and towards potentially to the GP if we preferred them and say, you know, I don't know really what's going on. Is there anything from primary care that we can really do at that point to support? I and mean, obviously we've suggested signposting places, but is it just, it really is just a waiting game at that point, is it? Yeah, I mean, it is very difficult. We, we, we have patients coming to us constantly in that period, that sort of phase where they're waiting for results. And it's very difficult. I mean, we do 
sometimes we try to get them to, to sort of engage with some counselling early on because often we not all patients we find come back to us in that point but those the group that do tend to be the ones then are, are anxious all the way through treatment um, so often we try and get things in place early on and mm -hmm. um, sometimes with patients that are really anxious about it I, I often refer them to complementary therapy early on even before they started their treatment so that they can go and have some something like that some massage reflexology in that interim just to try and yeah. offer something constructive uh, in, in that time while they're waiting and I guess um you know, something that's relevant when, it, when there's a sort of a, abrupt cutoff, you know, some of those numbers that you showed would, would come back, you know, if you're 60% you need chemo and if you're 15% you yeah. don't. Like, how does it, do you, do you give patients the numbers? They can it's just quite arbitrary, coming, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, they can come to us and go, well, I had 15% and if I'd been a bit higher, I'd have had chemo. <laughs> now I don't know what to do because they said I'm 50. Like, do you give them a choice or would it just be, you know, you're sitting in a, in a group that would be considered to be lower risk, so therefore we wouldn't recommend it and other people would choose it? Yeah, or, so... Yeah, it's a good point. So we try and be clear why we're doing it. And to be fair, the surgeon, the one, the, our surgical colleagues are quite good at explaining anyway. So they tend to have quite good understanding, mostly when they come to us. Um, and they try and assume. So what is happening now, as soon as we find that they're eligible for oncotypic, the surgeon can request it, or one of us requests it soon after it's been discussed in the MDT to limit that weight um, as much as possible. Um, and we try and explain it that, you know, there's the low risk and there's a the high risk and then there's the middle group um, and you fit in the middle group. And we're just, basically, we're just trying to, you know, if you get, a couple of years ago, you would have been offered chemotherapy up front, but we've got a way of seeing whether we can avoid it um, safely. And usually they, they're quite okay with that, aren't they? They, they tend to, um, I don't know if you see that in primary care, if you see the fallout, because we think that, oh, we communicated that well when we deal with the fallout. Um, if, if so, please um, um, let us know, the oncology team know, but generally they have a good understanding and actually quite a few of them are up for doing, nearly all of them are up for doing the oncotype or the Optima trial. As long as you've been, um, a couple really that say no I want chemo up front and that's fine it's yeah. about exploring options really it's a case by case discussion um if the oncotype though comes back as less than one percent chemo benefit and a score of like I don't know three or one I had once then it's a it's a it's really a no-brainer and yeah. I'd be very comfortable saying actually no I don't think chemotherapy is right for you but you know where it's a bit like in a grey area, I'd say probably from 15 to 25. It's about having that discussion. I've had patients, um, usually postmenopausal patients, that are saying, actually, I don't, I don't want chemo actually, and I'm quite happy with that score and and they're fine. So it's it's about having that discussion and exploring every option and going by what the patient would want. And if they still want chemotherapy um, with a you know a middling score, then I'd be comfortable with that but if they had a very low score then I would say actually there's really no benefit here um, and that's particularly for patients that are um, node negative and then the um, we, yes it's always no negative anyway it's near non type so those particularly patients that are you know post menopausal I'd be quite comfortable saying actually that's that's fine um, thank you Thank you so much. If you could just move the slide on one, um, Joe. We've got uh, just the feedback QR code and, and um, survey link on the last slide. People are just dropping off now if they want to complete those. It will get emailed out as well. Um, thank you very much to both of you for your you know, really informative chat today. And it was really you know, relevant to primary care and really grateful. And as well, those local links to people who work locally of services that are available, that, that's great. Um, there's three more webinars coming up over the following three Wednesdays. So next week it's upper GI, then we've got an early prostate cancer update and finally a gynecology update. So um, I'll close the meeting now, just I'm aware of time, but thanks again to both of you and to Charlotte for hosting. <laughs>